Walsh. Good morning. Good morning, Suzanne. Please state your name. Tommy Douglas Benefield Jr. Can you spell those? Yes, ma'am. T O M M I E. Middle name Douglas D O U G L A S. Last name Benefield B E N E F I E L D N Jr. And what was your relationship to Doug Benefield? I'm Doug's first cousin. Okay. How close were you and Doug? Doug and I uh, were completely attached, connected all the way through his adult life at varying times from daily to semi-annually, certainly quarterly, though in a whole entire adult life. Okay. And how are you employed? I'm currently employed by a major airline out of Atlanta, Georgia, and I run a flight school or a portion of a flight school in Borough Beach, Florida, three days a week. It's a full-time job. Okay. And um, were you and Doug close about uh, flying? Yes, ma'am. He followed me into the Navy. I was a Navy pilot off aircraft carriers. And uh, Doug stayed with me in the months prior to him going into the Navy. He went through aviation officer candidate school, went through flight school, and then flew for three years and two deployments off aircraft carriers like I did. Same aircraft carrier, USS Nimitz, as a matter of fact. Okay. How old was Doug Benefield when he died? All right. He was five years younger than me. I'm 68 now. That was four years ago. 64. He was 59, I believe. About how tall was Doug? 5'9", five, 5'10", five, at the most. Okay. Approximately how much did he weigh at the time? My, my guess is 160, 165. He was slender and fairly small for a man. Okay. And before Doug moved to Florida, where did he live? Before he moved, Be before he moved down here to Bradenton, Florida, where did he? Okay, live I'm sorry, that? I did. I had to pick a year at that point. <laughs> I'm sorry. He he has a, he had a home all the way up until his death in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, just north of Charleston. Seven hundred one Preservation Place was the address. Okay, and he lived at that address before moving to Bradenton, Florida, correct? Yes, ma'am, and then he rented the house out when he moved to Bradenton for visitation of their daughter. Okay. And before he met Ashley, who did he live with at the house? The house for, for multiple years was Doug, his longtime wife Renee, and their daughter Eva. That's prior to Renee's death in 2015, December of 2015. Okay. So Renee died in 2015. Do you know how she died? Yes, ma'am. She died of a uh, undiagnosed uh, heart ailment, cardiac arrest. Okay. Is well, not oh. lack of qualifications? Yes. Overruled on that basis. Okay. Was Renee Eva Benefield's mother? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I'm sorry, can you say that date again? Was 2015 that she died? I believe it's December 2nd, but I may have the day off, but not the month okay. of 2015. 2015. All right. And I want to ask you now, switch to Ashley. So about how long after Renee died did um, Doug meet Ashley? Nine months. Okay. When did you first meet Ashley? I met Ashley uh, in the spring of 2017. I believe the date was either March 14th or April 14th. Um, and did you know about Ashley before you met her? No, ma'am. Okay. How did your meeting come about? Uh, I was flying for Southwest Airlines as a captain at the time. They changed my schedule like they do many times in the airline world. And I ended up not overnighting in Baltimore, Maryland, and they sent me to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, because I was going to Charleston, uh, I texted Doug and said, hey, I'll be in to Charleston tonight. Uh, I'd like to have dinner. And he said, great. Drag Text your side. Sustained. Okay. Uh, during your conversations, did he mention the name Ashley? 
in the second text chain, which is entered. Object or sustained. I'm asking because. I can answer the question, ma'am. <laughs> when I arrived in Charleston, I texted Doug, and his text to me specifically was. Object, you, uh, you can't speak about what Doug said to you. Okay. But during the text messages, did he indicate to you there was a female involved? Yes, that's the okay. first mention of Ashley to me, that we were not going to have dinner at the airport, and that I was to take Uber up to Mount Pleasant to meet them. Okay. And was that at their house? That was at Doug's house. Yes, ma'am. 701 Preservation Place. Doug's house at the time. And when, how long were you with them, the two of them together? Uh, four to five hours. We started at the house. We ended up going back to my hotel, uh, getting a piece of medical technology, medical device that I was a master trainer in that device. We had dinner together at a pizza restaurant across from the hotel and then went back to my room in the hotel, the three of us, and uh, certainly four to five hours that day. And during this time, did you have multiple conversations with both of them? We had conversations about everything, especially about how they met, Okay. starting and at the house, ending at the hotel. And what did Ashley say about how they met? She talked about how they met at a political event, a meeting, uh, where Doug and his business investors That's were... Personal knowledge. Defendant's statement. Yeah, over, overruled. You can go ahead. Uh, both Ashley and Doug told me about how they met the first night at a political meeting, how Ashley had reached out to him before that meeting. They showed me text messages between them for the 10 days between the first meeting and her second meeting with him up in Charleston, Mount Pleasant. Uh, they talked about how they had mutual interest, mutual alignment, how they were looking for the same thing in a relationship. They talked about, uh, Ashley talked specifically about her fibromyalgia uh, and pain associated with her ballet dancing days. Uh, Ashley talked about her mother, her upbringing, uh, about her father, about the separation there. Okay. Do you have an objection? Yes, sir. And the basis? You're sick. It's, uh, it's my understanding this is the defendant's statement. Yes. Or overruled. Okay. Let me stop you there. So she said they met, that her and Doug met at a political event. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And at the time that you were meeting with them, were they married? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did Ashley indicate to you when they got married or how long they had been married? Yes, ma'am. 13 days from first meeting. That, that they got married 13 days after they met? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did they did Ashley indicate where they got married? Yes, ma'am. And where was that? That was in Mount Pleasant or Charleston. Uh, Doug's best friend at the time, Tripp, married them. Okay. Did Ashley ever discuss with you that she carried a gun? Yes. And what did she say about that? She said that on their initial meeting, in the political meeting, that she and Doug and Doug's uh, traveling partner in business went outside, outside of Secret Service people, and she showed him the gun she was carrying at that event in her bra. Okay. And she talked to you about this during your meeting? Yes, ma'am. Now, I want to jump forward a little bit, but did you have any conversations that night about them wanting to have a child? Or was that a different time? I don't remember us talking about it that first night, no ma'am. Okay. Do you remember a conversation with Doug and Ashley, specifically Ashley, about them wanting a child? I, I believe it was later in, in, uh, in the late spring, the next time that I visited with them. Okay. And to your knowledge, could Doug have children? He had had a vasectomy after having his daughter with Renee, his okay. longtime wife. Did Ashley... I'm sorry, so no. Okay. He couldn't have children. Did Ashley speak about that in front of you, Ashley and Doug together, or Ashley separate about the vasectomy? They did when they were discussing having Doug have a vasectomy reversal. Yes, okay. ma'am, I believe so. Okay. 
Right. And to your knowledge, did that reversal ultimately go through? Yes, ma'am, and I believe Ashley actually paid for it on a credit card. They talked about that. Okay. And ultimately, she became pregnant? Yes, three months after the vasectomy was reversal, she became pregnant. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did they end up, I'm going to skip a little bit forward. Yes, ma'am. Did they end up having a wedding reception? They did. I believe it was June of 2017. Uh, I was single parenting at the time, and I wasn't able to attend, but it was in Charleston, South Carolina, at the home of one of uh, Doug's business partners. Okay. You mentioned um, something about ballet dancing, so I'm going to ask you about that. In your meetings and discussions with Ashley, did she indicate she was interested in the ballet? Uh, she spoke about the fact that she had been a ballet dancer, that she had performed in, I'll, I'll call them shows, uh, back, I believe, in Maryland where she grew up. And by the time that I first met them, met Ashley, they had formed the ballet company called the American National Ballet in Charleston. And they were, at the time that I first met her, they were working on getting that ballet company up and running. Okay. And was this going to be a large endeavor? Several million dollars, yes, ma'am. Okay. Up to 40 dancers were hired. Yes, ma'am, large endeavor. Okay. And do you know what Doug's role was in that? In your discussions with Ashley, did you find out what Doug's role was? Yeah, Doug that? and Ashley talked about it on the first night I met them, met her, uh, about how they founded the ballet, how Doug did the online uh, limited liability corporation work, uh, founded the name, resurrected that name, how they worked together to... Uh, try to build a ballet that was diverse and open to more than one body size, body shape, body color. Uh, that was the philosophy of the ballet as they explained it. That was Ashley's dream. And how was it funded? It was funded several ways. Uh, a number of Doug's business partner, friends, and Doug himself invested money. Uh, they had a, uh, a major, let's say, arts benefactor in Charleston who a, was is a personal injury lawyer who was going to be the primary major donor. In Doug's case, Doug was working on very advanced technologies and patents at the time. And in his case, he didn't have any savings or cash in the bank. So he sold his future stock grants and options to other investors to put him his own money in, about $100,000 in his case. So while this ballet was in development or launching, did Ashley ultimately become pregnant? I know you said she became pregnant several months later, but I'm just trying to get a timeline. Yes, ma'am. So in February of 2017, are the records and what they told me about founding it. I met her in maybe a month or two after that on that Charleston overnight. They held the first uh, ballet event and I was invited in May of 2017. Uh, once again, single parent, I wasn't able to attend. They, She got pregnant in July um, and we talked about that multiple times. And the next month in August was the large launch, which me, my business partners, my veteran friends, supporters of Doug all went to Charleston for that major launch in August. It was at a place, I'm sorry. And at that time, was Ashley pregnant in August? She was pregnant. I, I don't know. remember if she knew or not. It was okay. one month after the pregnancy was conceived, uh, Emerson was conceived. And at some point, did Ashley move away from the South Carolina home? Yes, ma'am. We, we had the August ballet big launch. Two weeks later, uh, Doug moved Ashley down to uh, Ashley's mother's home in Lakewood Ranch. Uh, down, drove down one day, dropped her off, and drove back the next day. That's late August. 
And what was the understanding, um, what was Ashley's understanding of, of why she was moving and what was going on? Uh, in text conversations and personal conversations with Ashley. Yeah. Defendant's statement. It's going to be the defendant's statements. Can we approach her? Yes. Okay. So I believe we were talking about the reason that Ashley went to Florida. Yes, ma'am. So in your discussions with Ashley, either text or in person or on the telephone, did she indicate to you that she was going to Florida because she was sick? And that, was, her that was the initial indication. Yes, ma'am. And her mother could better take care of her. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Throughout the time that you saw Doug and Ashley together, how did Doug act? In particular, on the opening night and all the way through uh, their relationship, opening night, totally in love, uh, both of them in love with each other. Um, Doug was always very respectful. He was very, very respectful with her in front of me, both that initial night and then the next weekend, I believe in May, that I spent down in Sarasota, Bradenton with them. Um, every time he was respectful of her, uh, they were in love. They, they never showed anything in front of me other than caring for each other. That was going to be my next question. So did you see anything other than that? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Good morning, Mr. Benefield. Good morning, Mr. Taylor. Um, you were a Navy, Navy pilot, correct? Navy pilot. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and um, I think you mentioned the training that you had briefly, correct? I went through extensive training all my 30-year career, yes, sir. Okay. Um, some of that training um, included uh, close quarters combat, did it not? No, sir, never. No hand-to-hand -hand no, training sir. at all? No, sir. Uh, do you remember having a conversation um, where you related... Um, information about close quarters combat? Yes, sir. I was in charge. I was the senior. Do you remember the, that conversation? Which one, sir? I don't know about which one you're speaking about. close quarters combat. If it was, it was in perspective of me running security and self-defense training for my airline, not the Navy. You received no such training in the Navy? No, sir. Never. Did Doug admit to you firing the gun in the Objection. kitchen of their home? Can we approach? Yes. Mr. Benefield, um, do you recall that Ashley had left your cousin Doug in the fall of 2017? Yes, sir. Specifically, September 18th of 2017. Yes, sir. I'm aware of that date and the events. <clears throat> Do you recall writing to Ashley Benefield in a text in um, May of 2018? I'm a fan of yes, yours. Yes, sir. So, Mr. Benefield, <clears throat> following... Ashley's leaving your cousin Doug in September two thousand September eighteenth of two thousand and seventeen. Were you a fan of Ashley Benefield's in May of two thousand and eighteen? I don't remember specifically that word, but it may have been in our lengthy phone calls and uh, text messages from January through June, possibly. You expressing support for her. Support for her story of the case, yes, sir. Yeah. And did you tell her, in fact, at one point she married the Objection. wrong Benefield? Sustained. Did you feel that she married the wrong Objection. Benefield? Relevance. Approach. Thank you. So, Mr. Benefield, after expressing your support for Ms. Benefield in 2018, um, several months after she left your cousin Doug. <clears throat> By the way, 
Do you know why she left your cousin Doug? The initial reason or the second reason? Do, do you know the reasons that Ashley Benefield gave your cousin Doug as to why she left him? Objection here, sir. I'm going to need the source. Is this from? Well, I'm not going to ask. Is it being offered for the truth? I mean, yeah, uh, it's not being offered for the truth, and I'm not going to go into the substance. I just want to know if this witness knows. Oh. <clears throat> you can answer. Did Doug share with you the reasons why she left him? He shared two different reasons. Yeah. All right. So now you express several months following that, that you're a fan of hers. And do you also not say to her that she married the wrong Benefield? I don't remember that specific text in the six months of open communication between she and I. All right. Let me see if I can refresh your recollection. Objection. I'm going to show you a document. Why don't you take a moment and look at it and tell us if that refresh, refreshes your recollection as to whether or not you suggested to Miss Benefield she'd married the wrong Benefield. does not say anything about marrying the wrong Benefield. Does it say? Objection. Hold on. Sir, has that document, without identifying it, we need to lay the predicate. <clears throat> Mr. Benefield, does that document reflect the, of the communication that you shared with Ms. Benefield? I believe it's correct and unaltered. All right. And it's between you and Miss Benefield. Is yes, it sir. Not? Yes, sir. And it's accurate, is it not? I believe so. Okay. Now, may I approach? Yes. Can you say thank you, Mr. Benefield? Yeah, approach, Mr. Taylor, State. Does the document I've shown you, Mr. Benefield, refresh your recollection of that particular exchange? Yes, sir. Right. Now, would you tell us your recollection having been refreshed, whether or not Tell us what your response was to Ashley's text. This is six months, and you want me to just focus on just tell us what line. your is Mr. that what Benfield, correct, Mr. Taylor? Just tell us what your response was to Ashley's text. Your recollection having been refreshed. As she says in the text. Mr. Okay. Benefield. Sustained. Please tell us what your response to Ms. Benefield's text was now that your recollection has been refreshed. There are multiple on the page, sir. Mr. Benefield, I think you know what I'm referring to. Would you please answer my question? I would like to answer it in, as it pertains to what she said. I didn't I ask you what she said, Mr. Benefield. I asked you to please tell us your recollection having been refreshed, what you said. Would you like me to read and that? Judge, bubble? I would object. We do not need to be reading from the stock. All right. Hold on. Deputy, would you please take the jury into the jury room? If you could give us five minutes, I'd appreciate it. Okay. When we began this portion of the discussion, the question was, uh, did you tell Ms. Benefield that she married the wrong person? The wrong Benefield. The wrong Benefield.
And I sustain that as hearsay with no exception. Uh, it, I found that it didn't provide impeachment of any prior inconsistent statement. What I did allow was him to testify as to his then existing mental, physical, or emotional conditions or feelings um, with the question being, did you feel that she had married the wrong Benefield? There was then the attempt to use these text messages that I still have not seen. I don't know what the substance of them was, uh, but where we were was my understanding and what I heard was the defense was attempting to refresh the witness's recollection. And what I have said is it sounded like it started to morph into some mix of impeachment and refreshing recollection and some elements of introducing a past recollection recorded. And that's where we're at. So, uh, state your objection. My objection, first of all, is the predicate has been laid to refresh recollection. But then the witness has not been asked what his recollection is other than to read it off of the paper, which is commingling past recollection and either past recorded or um, something of that nature. I think we're commingling the two different things. And if this witness needs to be asked, if it refreshes his recollection, then he can be asked that question without reading the document. I would object to any reading of the document because it is extrinsic evidence if it's being used for impeachment. I do not believe his state of mind is relevant to a material issue in this case. I think the defense is trying to say that it goes to bias, but I'm not quite sure how that how that fits into it. So my objection would be it's improper refresh, refreshing recollection. It's improper impeachment. It's also improper um, prior recorded recollection, and I would object to that being testified about. Any response? Mm -hmm. Yes. So <clears throat> as succinctly as I can, Your Honor, he's a creep. He acknowledged being a creep, and the jury will conclude he's a creep. It goes directly to his character and his bias. And that's why, after he said, yes, it was accurate, I recall it, he cannot bring himself to say it. And the reason he can't bring himself to say it is because he knows that all these women on the jury are going to know exactly what he was referring to. So I am trying to impugn his credibility after listening to everything that he had to say to set up the state's position about how this relationship was so lovey-dovey between Miss Benefield and Douglas Benefield and what a wonderful relationship it was here we now have this witness very begrudgingly admitting that after Miss Benefield leaves Douglas Benefield and she leaves the letter, which I know the court has seen because I attached it as an earlier exhibit to a motion, he's still supporting her. And he's not only supporting her, but he's telling her she married the wrong Benefield. Yeah. In my world, Your Honor, based upon the rules of evidence, I am entitled to go after his credibility, which he has put in question by virtue of taking the witness stand and becoming a witness. I did it the way the court wanted. I asked the magic question, does this refresh your recollection? He said it did. Now I want him to tell me in response to my question, did you tell Miss Benefield she married the wrong Benefield? And he cannot bring himself to acknowledge it. He wants to talk about anything else but that. And I think, Your Honor, 
anything that I'm capable of showing where this witness, Doug Benefield's loving cousin, Tommy Benefield, where this witness showed his support for Ashley Benefield after she left Douglas Benefield, goes directly to his credibility. You can't get up there and testify to all of these things about how wonderful this relationship was and then on cross-examination have to acknowledge that you were still saying you're a fan of Miss Benefield's after she leaves him, knowing the reason she left him. I intentionally didn't go into the reasons to try to be straight with the court, but now I'm attempting to impugn his credibility. And he knows it, Judge. He's looking at me like a deer in the headlights. I'm going to allow you to respond. I previously mentioned about confining arguments to legal and factual bases. I am also going to direct both sides to refrain from vituperative uh, ad hominem attacks. Uh, I don't think we need to resort to name calling. I think it's inappropriate and unprofessional to refer to a witness as a creed. All right, with that said, go ahead for your response. The first thing, Judge, I don't know if you have the copy of the text message up there. The defense could give it to you. Nowhere in there does it say she married the wrong benefit. That is not what it says, first of all. And second of all, Tommy Benefield never said that anything about their relationship and the tenor of their relationship once she left. He said, when I saw them together, they looked fine. Just because that changes down the road and he knows they're having problems, I am unaware of how that affects his credibility. He can clearly see that they're having problems later on down the road. I don't see how the timing being different somehow makes him inconsistent and somehow that attacks his credibility or it, it shows his bias. Um, if Mr. Taylor wants to ask him, were you aware that there were problems after that? Yes, I was aware of that. I mean, in Mr. Taylor's argument, he is impeaching the fact that Mr. T that Tommy Benefield saw them acting loving to each other. If that wants to be impeached or explored, then ask Mr. Benefield if he saw them after that or knew that they were not loving and having that type of relationship. I don't understand the relevance of these types of conversations. I think the defense tends to say everything is about bias, but it has to comport with the rules of evidence. And I would say that this does not. All right, thank you both very much. I think it is uh, an impeachable question to ask, did you feel that she married the wrong Benefield? But it's not what he wrote, it's what he felt. That's where, the, that's where you're mixing apples and oranges, the defense is. The question that was presented to me was, did you feel that she married the wrong Benefield? He can answer yes or no. If there's then some extrinsic evidence that may impeach him on that point, I would then have to make a determination is, is that extrinsic evidence admissible or not? Because if it's a collateral matter that's not material, then the, the as you well know, Mr. Taylor, you get the answer you get. As I've mentioned before, and I mentioned pre-trial, I expect attorneys to know the differences between impeachment by a prior inconsistent statement, that's one path. Refreshing recollection is a second path, and past re introduction of past recollection recorded, which is a separate path. And the reason I'm sustaining the objection is because it started off with refreshing, does it refresh your memory? And then we got right back into the documents themselves, which I've already ruled were hearsay. 
So it's for impeachment purposes only. I don't know how to say it any 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 more clear than that. So if you're refreshing his recollection, then we're going to take that path. Yes. I believe I did that. I believe I refreshed his recollection and he acknowledged that. So then my question was, what did you say? Actually, and that gets back to the documents. This I, if he says his memory is refreshed, you take the document back or whatever the thing is that you use to refresh recollection is to be retrieved. And then you, then the person testifies from their own personal knowledge. So once he said that he recalls, I then asked him if he said that you married the wrong Benefield. That's what I said. I will be happy to to go through that again, Your Honor. Uh, now, did I leave the document there when I asked him that? Yes. I didn't feel it was necessary to take the document back, but after he acknowledged that his memory was refreshed, I asked him, did you say that she married the wrong Benefield? And that's where we were when Your Honor sent the jury out he was trying to come to terms with how he was going to answer that. Sir, this doesn't say what you're asking him. Yeah, approach. Thank you, Ron Benefield. Ms. Benefield says, that's very cool. You should be so proud of what you were doing. His response is, thank you, Ron Benefield. What that means, Your Honor, what that suggests is, thank you, you should have been with me. Sustained. I assure you, Judge, that any female will draw that conclusion immediately. That does not match what you're asking, sir. All right, are we ready to bring the jury back in? Do you want to treat this as your mid-morning break? All right, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Benefield, when we last were assembled, you were, um, we were waiting for you to answer the question whether you felt Ashley had married the wrong Benefield. No, sir, I did not believe that. Was it a joke? It was an attempt to keep our communication open between us. Now, <clears throat> we've established that you were aware that Ashley left Doug in September of 2017. Yes, sir. And we've also established that following that, you expressed your support of her. Yes, sir. All right, now I want to direct your attention specifically to the month of November of 2017. Were you aware of a domestic violence injunction that Ms. Benefield sought and obtained from South Carolina court? Yes, sir, at that time. And did you express to Ms. Benefield? Yes. You can ask the question. Your support of her after she obtained that domestic violence injunction? Sustained. Did you support Ms. Benefield in November of 2017 following the issuance of a domestic violence injunction? Not specifically about that, sir. Do you recall expressing your support on Saturday, November 4th, 2017? I don't remember that specifically, sir. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Mr. Benfield, I'm going to show you a document, see if this refreshes your recollection.
the areas that I check refresh your recollection? Yes, sir. Those appear to be my statements. All right. The recollection having been refreshed, Mr. Benefield, on November 4th, following the issuance of the domestic violence injunction to Ms. Benefield, did you express your support to her? There are two problems with your question for me, sir. Would, I'm going to ask you. Would you answer my question, and then you can certainly feel free to explain it. I was unaware of the, I believe I was unaware of any uh, result of any pending case in South Carolina at the time I texted that. I thought you just told us you were aware. I became aware after the fact when it was, when it was, when the mutual protection order was entered, I, was, I, I found out about it after the fact, but I don't remember the date of that event as it relates to the November 4th. I have no further questions, Ron. State, any redirect? No. Can this witness be released? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Taylor, can this witness be released?